Hello, there is nothing worse than having one's bio read out in front of you, <laughs> particularly when you wrote it yourself. Uh, I am Eric Drass, I'm an artist uh, in various mediums. Um, predominantly, I'm brought to this thing for my digital works. Uh, I'm not actually going to talk about much of my work, I'm just going to talk about the theme, as Amy asked me to, which was about the Anthropocene. And my perspective is, what's our slice of life going to look like in the future? And how do we get at our current situation from the future? Um, and I've called it, what have we dumped in the digital landfill? Um, when we think about archaeology, we tend to think about digging holes in the ground, finding stuff, um, and inferring what life was like from the artifacts that we dig up. Sometimes it's treasure. This is uh, Boudicca's hoard with the things that were allegedly owned by Queen Boudicca. Um, and we get very excited about this stuff, but not as excited generally as the mundane, the, the pots, the shards of pottery, the napped knives. It's the kind of stuff that you use in your day-to-day -day life that really is useful to future archaeologists. It's digging up the stuff that you use in every day, not what you did when you were praising Queen Boudicca. These days, a lot of the stuff that we do uh, is online. We take pictures of ourselves, we write blog posts, uh, we send messages to each other. Quite a lot of our culture now exists in this space, which has no physical footprint. No one's going to dig up some ones and zeros out the ground in the future, like they were going to dig up uh, a piece of bone or a piece of pottery. Um, nor are they going to dig up your old love letters, because people don't write love letters anymore. They send them as dick pics or whatever they do. Um, you know what I mean? It's like, they don't, they don't exist. You're not going to stumble across a box of great uh, memories because we're doing all our stuff online. So uh, taking the putative role as a future archaeologist, just looking at different kinds of data that we're producing, um, what it might look like, and uh, what people do about uh, massaging that data for the future, if they do anything at all. So we're going to start with embarrassing data. Um, <laughs> Because there's a lot of data around, there's a lot of data on all these people and all these companies, all these interactions, all these politicians. Sometimes you want to get rid of it uh, because it doesn't suit your current narrative. One of the problems with digital data is you can get back at it while it's still alive. While the computer that runs it and holds that data is being funded with money and enthusiasm, that data lives until someone turns this machine off or they run out of money. Um, and while those machines hum, sometimes there's stuff humming on those machines that you don't like. So I'm going to start with a, um, a real archaeology story. So I don't know if you remember 1982 when E.T. came out, a very popular film. Uh, Atari, the video game company, uh, were very excited about E.T. Paid $21 million to get the rights to E.T. Uh, they paid $21 million six weeks before Christmas. So they had to conceive, program, bug test, build the cartridges, send them out, get them to the shops for Christmas. They produced five million copies of the E.T. video game cartridge. Um, and it was shit. <laughs> I'm going to read out the description here, which says, a virtually unplayable game <laughs> with a dull plot and crummy graphics in which frustrated players spent most of their time leading the E.T. character around, uh, around in circles to present him, prevent him from falling into pits. That's basically what you do. You walk around and then you fall in things and you have to start again. Uh, Atari produced five million cartridges and according to Atari's then president and CEO, quote, nearly all of them came back. Um, so you've got five million video games for the biggest hyped film of the year and everyone hates them. Um, Rumours began that Atari solved this problem by burying them in the desert. <laughs> and this story went on for many, many years and people believed there were millions and millions and millions of these terrible video games hiding in the desert. And as is the way with the internet, someone dug them up. <laughs> they went to New Mexico on uh, the 26th of April 2014 and they removed several tons of earth from this site in New Mexico and they found quite a lot of trash. They found quite a lot of video games but they didn't find five million of them. They only found a couple of hundred. 
which in some ways were disappointing, but it means there's still five million copies of E.T. sitting around somewhere in the world. They're not buried in the desert. So, however hard you try to hide this stuff, even if you literally bury it in the ground, someone's going to come along and try and dig it up. It's a, it's a cautionary tale for digital data. Um, here's a cautionary tale for digital data from 2013. Ah, um, oh, remember the hallowed days of 2013. It was all so simple then, wasn't it? It's just ham face in charge. Anyway, um, bizarrely, in 2013, um, the Conservative Party deleted all the speeches of David Cameron from the internet. Uh, some sort of website error or something. So uh, the uh, population of Britain couldn't actually look back and see what he'd promised or what he'd said. Or No, it strangely disappeared. Unfortunately, this being the internet, they didn't really disappear. Uh, so I went and got them. Um, <laughs> and uh, then parse the entire text for the uh, syllabic and rhyming qualities and produced a machine that writes poetry out of the abandoned speeches of David Cameron. Um, here's one, there isn't any money left. Here's another example, planning, I trust people. Why have we not hired a czar? The liberals have little to say. We need a proper inquiry into all of this kind of sparse, beautiful poetry. Click a button, there's an infinite number of them coming out. <laughs> so, lesson one, it's difficult to hide embarrassing data, it comes back to catch you. Number two, I talk about worthless data. So, we tend to think about the value of our data, particularly these days with Facebook. Oh, Facebook knows loads of stuff about me, so I can sell adverts and make money out of me. I'm valuable. But that's uh, a moving cycle in culture. Things that are popular one day are forgotten the next. Uh, for example, GeoCities. Oh. I, I don't know if anyone remembers GeoCities. Meet the web's coolest pet. Um, GeoCities was formed in 1994, uh, and there were a number of cities uh, where you could build your house. And there was a Hollywood city where you could put your entertainment stuff, and there was a Silicon Valley where you could put your stuff. And it was enormously popular. Um, you may not remember GeoCities, but you probably remember the dancing baby. Oh, yeah. That dancing baby, that baby's 22 years old. That's a 22-year-old baby, yeah, 22 years ago. Uh, well, I think, it's, I think it's timelessly caught in very, very low resolution GIF. The baby can never grow up. No, except for repeats of Ali McBeal, maybe, I don't know. Um, GeoCity is also home of the under construction sign. Everyone had a page. It was always under construction. No one ever really finished. Um, it was so popular that Yahoo bought them. Um, and they bought them in 1999 and they paid $3.8 billion for GeoCities. At that time, GeoCities was the third largest site on the internet. Um, Ten years later, they shut it down. Yeah. <laughs> oh, has it disappeared? Here we go. No. There we go. They shut it down. And um, a lot of people were outraged because at this point, it had 38 million pages in it. 38 million little documents that people had created in their teens or 20s. People had got the first computer, first public display of what they were doing. And um, appropriately, people realised this is a bit of a horror that this stuff was going to be turned off. And for me, this is one of the first signs that really proved how digital data is so ephemeral. It only takes someone to run out of money, machine gets sent off, that stuff is gone. When you're uploading your photos to the cloud, you're uploading it to someone else's computer that's being paid for by someone, and at some point they're going to turn it off. It's going to go. So if you're a kind of future archaeologist, how this stuff survives over time is, is an issue. Thankfully, uh, there's a fantastic organisation called archive.org, uh, run by this guy, Jason Scott, who scrapes digital data, enormous quantities of data. Um, I think, what's it, 15 petabytes was the last measurement. They all public domain books, um, websites, a, they run a system called the Wayback Machine that takes snapshots when websites change. You can go back and see what the Tory party website looked like in 2010, because these guys are taking a snapshot because they recognise how important it is. Um, 
they archive stuff that you would think is trash, like America Online CDs. Remember these that come through your door? Yeah. Put in your computer, dial up now. Millions of them. But at this point, we think it's horrible trash and we don't care about it. But in a thousand years, who knows? Right? Just as the archaeologists digging in the ground, finding that little shard of pottery, actually having a functional record of what was going on in this time is really important. So it's good to hear that these guys are doing it. Um, you should check it out, actually. They, have, they also have a whole software collection you can run inside your web browser. So you can go and run the Atari terrible game of ET <laughs> and see how bad it is for yourself from the comfort of your laptop. And that's an amazing thing, right? the fact that you can recreate the systems to keep this stuff alive. So it's not all lost. People are out there trying to save stuff. Um, but not all of it. So number three, abandoned data. Um, this is a more recent project from earlier this year of someone who's been data mining Minecraft. I don't know if you're familiar with Minecraft, a modeling game where mainly used by kids to go out and build stuff. There's also a small option where you can write messages to each other and say, hey, Fred, come here, there's gold or whatever. Um, and there's a phenomenal quantity of these virtual realms made by kids that have, have been abandoned, like a, a literally abandoned cities. And someone built a piece of software to go and look and see what messages were in there, to actually look for the pieces of text to see what the people were leaving for each other. And it's quite fascinating. Um, found memorials that people had set up for kids who died, who were like really loved in the game, who'd gone and they discovered, and people would come along and set up in this Minecraft their memorials to kids who died. Or um, little letters to each other. This one here, Dear Nikki, today is your 14th birthday. Possibly the best birthday. I couldn't ask for a better friend or sister. This stuff that was written, you know, five, ten years ago, that was very heartfelt and true and kind of important culturally, that this stuff is going on in these spaces, but left and gone, like this, not even gathering dust, because there's not any digital dust. They're just sitting there until someone flicks a switch and it's gone. So it's really important to keep it alive. Um, this one I found when I was researching quite disturbing. It appears to be a suicide note. You know, I don't really know how to put this, but I guess I feel a little alone right now. Seems like I'm not just so good, blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't want to live anymore. Who knows if that's a suicide note or not left in Minecraft. This stuff is like uh, uh, capturing some of the most intimate and personal moments for, the, for our kids who are living in this game, living far more in this game than they are in reality, talking to each other. What happens when these machines get turned off? Who knows what stuff is being lost? Um, final bit of data, hidden data. Uh, so there's a lot of data that is captured by private companies. Prime example being Facebook. Um, you may think, oh, well, I've posted that picture of my kid and my holiday snaps, and I've replied to the latest comments about Corbyn, and they're fine. That's my public record of Facebook. Facebook captures an enormous amount of data around that. Facebook captures your mouse movements on the screen. They know when you pause in your feed, how long you stop at something. They know if you've clicked on that ex-girlfriend's beach holiday and looked at her bikini photos. They've recently patented uh, technology to read the faces of the people posting while they type their posts to assess their mood. They also admit to data mining the posts that you write and then delete without posting because they're capturing the key presses. All of this stuff is fascinating and useful to Facebook, but it's entirely owned by Facebook. There's no way of getting at that. Even when you get your Facebook archive, they're not telling you actually all this other stuff about your behavior. But for a future archaeologist, that's fascinating. Right? You've got the actual real unwritten behavior of the people alongside their written behavior. Um, the other obvious place is um, governments. So Snoopers Charter allows the uh, government to record all of your web activity now. Um, and because of our lovely data sharing relationships with other countries, this is the combined federated battle lab. The, all of these countries share data with each other. So any data that the, the GCHQ is capturing on you can easily be transferred to Turkey through a data sharing relationship. So this stuff goes out and is shared with governments without our permission again. We don't get access to it. That stuff is hidden. So it's difficult for future archaeologists, I think, um, 
we're putting lots of stuff into this system, but it's a very complicated, fragmented system, and the ownership of the systems is not generally in public domain. Aside from archive.org that are organized, all of these people, all of these silos of data are controlled by businesses. Who are going to come and go, just like GSEs have gone? You know, 3.8 billion, and then zero. This is what happens. Facebook will be gone. Facebook may seem the most important thing in the world now, but it's going to be gone. It will be forever. Um, to get at the truth from this massively complicated data is hard. If I was able to have all the data on one individual in this room from all of their possible uh, connections with the internet, it would be difficult, it would be almost impossible to slice out the truth or the reality or a story out there because it's so complicated. What would I do with five years of mouse movements on Facebook? I, 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 I can't process that stuff. But Technology advances, science advances, and you find new ways of going at stuff that you've seen before. So I'm going to end on this example, which is a one centimeter piece of bone, which was found in a cave in Russia in 2010. And to you or I, I mean, it's not that big, right? To you, to you or I, we not notice this thing. But if you're an archaeologist, you know what you're looking for. Finds this, recognizes it's a piece of bone. They ran DNA analysis based on the DNA that remained in this bone. Um, I found it to be 50,000 years old. A 50,000 year old bone that had two different genetic parents. So the mother was uh, Denisovian and the father was Neanderthal. So the two different hominid lineages that met in a cave in Russia and produced a child. And this bone that was dug out of the cave, this tiny one centimeter piece of rock, was found and completely rewrites our understanding of humanity and the evolution. Um, the Denisovians and the Neanderthals di diverged 390 million years ago, sorry, 390,000 years ago. And we only became Homo sapiens about 50,000 years ago. So these two species diverged and came together and reproduced and produced a child before Homo sapiens even existed. And in fact, very shortly after this, in, in historical terms, about 10,000 years, they're all gone. It's just Homo sapiens. It teaches us some important stuff. But it involved the technology, it involved the piece of machinery and intelligence to be able to take a tiny fragment of bone and extrapolate this whole story about the history of humanity. That didn't exist when they dug the bone up eight years ago, but they have it now. And that's what's going to happen to our digital data. So as overwhelming and confusing and dense as it may seem, the tools to dig that stuff out and find it will, are being developed all the time. So we don't know whether the mouse movements on Facebook are going to be of value, but it's best to keep them alive just in case. Thank you. Thank you.